Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the 2013 Annual Parkinson's Disease Conference, Strength Through Optimism. My name is Krasanka Christodas. I'm coordinator for the Iowa Parkinson's Disease Information and Referral Center, which is supported by the Iowa chapter of the American Parkinson's Disease Association and the American Parkinson's Disease Association headquarters in Staten Island, New York. I've probably talked to many of you on the phone, met you at support groups, or conversed with you by email. And for many of you, um, I'm meeting you for the first time today. So if this is your first year at the conference, you're in for a great day of knowledge and support and optimism. Before I introduce our first speaker, just a couple of housekeeping details. Um, if you look in your conference program, there, are, there is an agenda and locations for our breakout sessions. Uh, all the, t the notes for the keynote sessions are in the program as well, as well as the speaker bios. The restrooms are near the main entrance where you checked in for registration and on either side of the worship center, which is the room that you're in right now. Um, if you see people in red t-shirts, those are our amazing volunteers. If you need help finding something, they will assist you. This event couldn't have been possible without the help of the Iowa chapter of the APDA, Teva Pharmaceuticals, Medtronic, UCB Phar Pharmaceuticals, and US World Meds. Uh, they are actually located in our exhibitor hall right across from the worship center here, along with many other area vendors and businesses that have lots of information and resources to offer. So please visit the exhibitors today during, when you, whenever you get a chance during the break and during lunch. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, I just also wanted to cover how we're going to do the Q&A session today. As you walked in, you got a, a tote bag and you also got a conference program and you were also given a couple of index cards in your tote bag or you, they were handed to you. If during the keynote presentation um, you find that you have a question, go ahead and write it down on the index cards and then volunteers in the red t-shirts will come by and pick them up. Um, and then at the end of the session, our uh, keynote speaker will go ahead and pick the questions and uh, go ahead and answer them. Um, we will be doing this for all the keynote sessions except the laughter yoga session, uh, which will take place uh, later this morning. So I wanted to go ahead and get started with our first keynote speaker. Dr. Monique Giroux is joining us today from Inglewood, Colorado. And in fact, she had a very late flight last night. So thank you, Dr. Drew, for making that late flight. Uh, she is a neurologist and she is co-founder of the Movement and Neuroperformance Center of Colorado. Additionally, she is medical director of the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation Wellness Center. She specializes in mind-body medicine and mindfulness therapy with a focus on interdisciplinary rehabilitation, team medicine, hope and wellness for people with progressive conditions. Many of you may own the Every Victory Counts manual, and I'll show that right over here. Um, and Dr. Drew co-authored that, and this is um, put out by the Davis Finney Foundation. And in fact, we have copies of this available for purchase at the American Parkinson Disease Association table in the exhibitor hall. And Dr. Drew offered to um, sign a few copies as well. So uh, feel free to pick that up today. Um, today, she's going to talk to us about holistic medicine uh, and living well with Parkinson's. So thank you very much, Dr. Drew, and please let, welcome her to the stage. Thank you, good morning, and thank you to the Iowa APDA for inviting me and putting on this lovely conference. So as you heard, I'm a neurologist. I'm a movement disorder specialist trained in the science of brain health and disease. But as I cared for more and more people with Parkinson's disease, I felt it was bigger than that. We need to treat the disease, we need to understand symptoms and so on. But the idea is to support a person's individual health and wellness. So I think although the science of medicine is important in treating Parkinson's disease, the life art of wellness is also a really very important piece. Whether you take a medication, are interested in vitamins and supplements, know the power of exercise, stress reduction, eating well, your spiritual well-being, sense of community and support. It now turns out that brain science, brain chemistry, brain physiology is proving that what is good for us really is good for us. 
And we now have evidence to show, brain evidence to show, that these therapies change our brain chemistry, physiology, and function potentially for the better. So holistic care of Parkinson's does include medication. It does include surgical therapies, but also these other treatments that may help you live well, cope well, and be well with a condition such as Parkinson's disease. So what I'll do today is give you a little philosophical overview of integrative medicine as an emerging field, but really the underpinning of what it's all about. And then present a few different categories of inter, er, inter, integrative medicine and review some of the therapies and how they may play a role for Parkinson's disease or caregivers with Parkinson's disease and the pros and cons. Now, some definitions, and I can't read the definitions from back there. I'll have to turn around. But believe it or not, this first definition is still the primary definition that is used for traditional Western medicine. It's a system in which medical doctors and other healthcare care prov providers or professionals treat symptoms and disease using drugs, radiation, or surgery. That's still the general definition of medicine in our culture, but we know it's bigger than that. And because of that and the need to support the individual in their healing process, various therapies such as alternative therapy and complementary therapies have come to play. Alternative therapies are healing practices not necessarily based on conventional medicine, but historical and cultural traditions. Well, that use the word alternative, and many people don't like the word alternative because it means one or the other, and it doesn't have to be one or the other. And then this whole idea of complementary medicine came on board just to state that these treatments, they're no longer alternative. You can complement, do the two together. Well, traditional medicine thought, maybe we should integrate this. And this emerging field of integrative medicine looks at what is the best of both worlds. And so it neither accepts all that, that traditional medicine has to offer, but doesn't negate or reject all that complementary or, or alternative therapies have to offer. But who uses complementary and alternative therapies? Well, most Americans do. The majority of complementary medicine used by Americans are vitamins and supplements, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. 60% or more of people with Parkinson's disease are interested in complementary therapies. Now here's one particular study that analyzed 201 people with Parkinson's to see what they were doing. Well, more than 26 of people, more than 26% of people with Parkinson's were using more than one complementary therapy. The majority of the complementary therapies, once again, vitamins and herbs, most of the time, people got the information about their therapies from a family member or friend, and very little of the time was their doctor or medical care, uh, med medical care provider aware of their therapy. And not only who, but why would you even consider these therapies? What's it all about? Well, in general, women tend to select alternative therapies and complementary therapies more. And in, and in general, women are the drivers of health care, usually in our society. People with higher education and people living with chronic conditions, which makes perfect sense. And why? And I think the why is the important part. And there's many whys, whether it be a sense of control over your disease, distrust in medications or our health care system, maybe perception that these therapies are safer than pharmacological therapies or maybe not having access to the right pharmacological therapies or cultural upbringing and marketing plays a big role in this. Big marketing power, big money behind these therapies and that's why we need to be very careful with our selection. But I think the most important reason why people are looking for more than just medical and surgical therapies because they believe that they have something more. They believe that they have this innate healing capability, and we all know we do. And that through supporting this capability, we can repair 
or enhance our sense of well-being. So it's about something within. And when I talk about integrative medicine or holistic care, it's really a patient-centered, a person-centered philosophy. What makes sense for you as a person, as an individual, given your experience with your conditions such as Parkinson's disease, your past histories with treatment, and so on. And when I talk about personal healing, it's really at two different levels. We're now measuring the impact of some of these therapies from a healing point of view actually at the cellular level, the body level, the physical level. But then also, of course, there's the emotional level and the supportive level. And those two aren't separate, right? One does affect the other. How the body feels might affect the emotions, and how the emotions are certainly will affect the body. So when we talk about personal healing, we have to get an idea of what it means to us. And the problem with healing is it means something different to every single person in this room. There's probably 300 different defin definitions here today. Well, they did a study where they brought together healing specialists throughout the United States and said, what's your definition of healing? What does it mean? So how do we support it? Because starting with a definition can help us support it. And as you can imagine, all of these specialists had different ideas, and it took a while to come to some consensus. But here was the consensus that they came to, and it works for me at a couple of levels. Personal healing involved themes of wholeness, narrative, and spirituality. Healing is an intensely personal, subjective experience involving a reconciliation of the meaning an individual ascribes to distressing events with his or her perception of wholeness. And there's certain words in there that I want to bring out. And that is this idea of wholeness and meaning, meaning and purpose. Because sometimes with Parkinson's disease, I think we divide the person up too much. They become a constellation of symptoms. They become tremor or freezing or walking problems or memory problems or what, what have you. But we need to support the person living with Parkinson's, not just the individual symptoms. And that's what healing is designed to do. And indeed, integrative medicine is really about this holistic approach. What brings balance? What brings wholeness back to a person's life in a way that supports what is important, adds value and meaning? And that's really how the person with Parkinson's disease and the clinician can work together. And this fancy diagram just has the additional arrow that at the bottom, if you look at it, I don't have a pointer, but transcendence and how people transcend and do well even in the setting of disease is when meaning and wholeness is brought to the picture. Now, it turns out that this idea of healing really is embraced by traditional medicine, but it's embraced in a different way. You've heard of the placebo effect. There's also a nocebo effect. Placebo effect is a non-specific response to a treatment. So you've probably heard of it as part of research trials, placebo and controlled trials, placebo being a sugar pill where they need to compare an active treatment to the sugar pill. Why do they need to do that? Because there's some other non-specific response that you as a person living in your environment, in your world, brings to the treatment and influences the treatment. So that's really very strong and powerful stuff if you think about it. But we tend to think about the placebo effect in traditional medicine as kind of a nuisance. It's something we want to get rid of because we want to prove our active treatment is much better than placebo effect or it's a statistical phenomena that we're trying to control for. But turns out this placebo effect is real and means something more to people with Parkinson's disease. Might I point out that there is also a nocebo effect? Nocebo effect implies a negative effect of treatment. So not all effects of treatment are in the positive direction. What contributes to the placebo effect? And this contributes perhaps to a lot of outcomes in healing-based therapies. There's a few things. 
conditioned learning. So, what you've experienced in the past affects how you're going to respond to a treatment. Now think about that for a minute, because if you start a medicine, if you go to rehabilitative therapy, or any other treatment you might start, what's your experience in the past? Has it been good? Not so good. And how might that be brought forward and change your response to treatment? But you can manipulate, you can change how you think about things and influence a treatment going forth. If you've had a lot of side effects on medicines in the past, and chances are I write out a prescription for another medicine, it's a much greater chance that you're just going to have a side effect again unless that is thought through and how that learning response affects your treatment. Is, is really brought to awareness. The other is expectation. The power of expectation, the power of the mind. The more we expect something to make a difference, the more it will. That's in a positive direction. That's also in a negative direction. Ah, uh, I don't know about that physical therapy. It doesn't really make a difference anyway. I went to it before. Two things, condition, learning, expectation. What's the chance that person is going to take that prescription for physical therapy and make it happen? Probably not as good. The other is meaning. And so much of life is about meaning, right? And this appears to be a particularly strong one as well. What the therapy means to you will influence the outcome. And in the Parkinson's world, it is why we need to study things carefully, because some things have very, very great meaning. Like, for instance, gene therapy or stem cell therapy comes with a lot of meaning. It's the meaning of hope and cure and so on. But that's very important, and that's a reason why we also have to control for the impact of meaning on true research outcomes and studies. Now there's two graphs on these slides, and I'll just walk you through them. The one on the left-hand side, what this graph shows with the line going up is people with Parkinson's disease. They were told they were getting a treatment, levodopa. They didn't know that they were getting placebo. And they measured release of dopamine in the brain. There's a way that you can do this through special nuclear imaging research studies. And release of dopamine in the brain to the placebo increased in relationship to their prior experience with levodopa. Remember I said the learning phenomena. So if levodopa really made a big difference in the past, it actually, the placebo increased how dopamine was released in the brain. The second graph with the bars was a similar research study where they once again told people with Parkinson's disease they're going to get their medicine or placebo. But this time what they did was they separated groups and said you have a 0% chance of getting the real medicine, 25%. 50%, 75%, and as the expectation that they were getting the real medicine went up, even though they got placebo, so did their physical and symptoms improve, and so did the release of dopamine increase. So it reflects the power of our mind and how we can influence our treatment. So I don't look at placebo as a nuisance. I look at it as something we can take advantage of. We have control over our thoughts, ideas, feelings, and the meaning we bring to the table. So today's conference about optimism, what do we bring to the table about our therapies? Do we share the optimism about what may potentially be and how it can change things, or glass half full? Are we influencing our treatments with the negative? So meaning does affect outcome. And one of the most interesting studies I've found 
It's not Parkinson's disease, but people with cancer. But I found this was so fascinating because it really brings in this idea of what meaning and importance, how that influences our outcomes. And they looked at people with cancer, particular kind of blood cancer. And these people were getting treatment. And then they looked at the outcomes, how well the treatment worked. And they were Chinese Americans. And they looked at the year of birth. So in, in Chinese culture, there's some better fated and some ill fated years of birth. And those that were born in the ill fated, in a more ill fated year, had poorer outcome to the treatment. And then it went one step farther. That was only as strong as their ties to their native culture and their belief in that. So it really does show how our mind, our beliefs, and meaning influence our outcomes. So that's what I mean by integrative medicine. It's not one or the other. You can practice integrative medicine by taking Cinemet, but bringing to the table your ideas and influence about how taking medicine is going to make a difference and how it's going to empower you to move better, be better, and feel better. So integrative medicine could be as simple as what you're already doing. I like to use the word enhanced medicine versus integrative medicine because I think it's all about this idea of what brings value, meaning, and wholeness back to the table. Not what dissects you into pieces and parts and symptoms, but brings you back to the sense of who you are, even with disease. And I like this definition because it's not one or the other. You don't either have Parkinson's or a disease or not. You're not either well or not well. You're you. You may happen to have Parkinson's disease. You may happen to be a care partner or someone with Parkinson's disease. But it's finding that definition of wellness and working towards that definition of, of healing for you, which is what enhanced medicine is all about. So let me go back to the definitions of why people even use alternative therapies because of this belief in this healing system that they have, that traditional medicine supports. Yes, indeed, really is there. So there's something to this. Now, the National Institute of Complementary Medicine divides alternative and complementary or integrative therapies into various categories. And it's somewhat arbitrary, but I'm going to use those categories today to describe some of the therapies and how they're used in Parkinson's disease. First, natural therapies, vitamins, supplements, botanicals, and food. So there's lots of reasons to talk about food as medicine. And when we even think about the etiology of Parkinson's disease, we know there's an influence of genes in the environment and maybe the influence of pesticides and solvents. So obviously what we're exposed to and what we put in our mouths might make a difference. There are many natural therapies that are explored for Parkinson's disease. And these natural therapies look at how the cell lives, survives, and is affected in disease. And so with neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's disease, these natural therapies might support our antioxidant system. Oxidative stress is a form of cell damage and cell death. Or maybe reduce inflammation in the cell or enhance the cell's energy producing mechanism. Maybe it's looking at immune health or supporting natural dopamine in the case of Parkinson's disease. And I've listed some of the therapies here. However, and so I am a movement disorder specialist, and I do take care of people with Parkinson's disease. It's not all about just uh, wellness. But people come to me because of my, well, my, my wellness interest. And what's the most common question they ask me? Doctor, I know you're interested in this wellness. I want to learn more about it. What vitamin and supplement should I take? That is the number one question I get. And they said, what's the secret? And I promise you, if there was a secret vitamin or supplement out there, it would not be a secret. <laughs> you would have that information by now. We would be sharing that information by now. You would be telling one another. It's not so simple as a vitamin and supplement for wellness, despite what marketing tells us, despite what 
people are selling. So we want to be careful about what we choose. And you're going to hear a little bit today about what I call the reductionist, therapy, the, uh, reductionist theory. And that's reducing a treatment down to a chemical or an entity. And it must be that that chemical or that entity is so good it's doing the job. The problem with vitamins and supplements is in the absence of a deficiency, there has not yet been a lot of evidence to support great benefit. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule. There's no doubt about it. And I'm not saying that vitamins and supplements are all bad. But I think we just have to be careful about why we're taking vitamin and supplement. And what are the side effects? And when I talk about side effects, I'm talking about more than just the side effect of the pill. I'm also talking about a side effect might be the cost. Or a side effect might be what you're not doing because you're taking that vitamin. So if I have an individual that is interested in what vitamin I should take because I'm, I don't really eat that well, and that vitamin's going to be my insurance and I don't have to worry about eating that well, remember going back to that wholeness and meaning theory, that's probably not going to be the best way to go. And what I've included in your handout, and I won't go through all of them, are some natural therapies that are being considered and often used in Parkinson's disease. But let me just bring out a few inconsistencies with this whole vitamin and supplement world. For instance, maybe 10 years ago, you heard a lot of information about how good vitamin E was. And within the heart world and heart disease and so on, vitamin E are very potent antioxidants. So we should take vitamin E. And as they started collecting studies in vitamin E, they found a slightly greater chance of early mortality in people taking high-dose vitamin E compared to those that weren't. Now, this is a natural vitamin substance. Turns out it's not quite so natural. As a matter of fact, the most common vitamin E off the shelf isn't really a natural form in the body. It's a slightly changed isomer, and vitamin E has four different forms. No, I'm sorry. Vitamin E has eight different forms in the body, not just one that's in the most common vitamin E supplement. So it's just an example where our perceptions that all, nat all that is natural is really not the way the body uses it naturally. The other is coenzyme Q10. Maybe a few years ago, many of you were on coenzyme Q10, research studies, placebo-controlled research studies, looking at coenzyme Q10, thought perhaps there's or, or resulted in perhaps not a positive benefit. The flip side of the argument for natural therapies is nutraceuticals or nutrients we get from, from food or perhaps from supplementation, really our bodies are designed to react to these over the long term. And studies only have a short period of time to measure. So sometimes it's hard to know what to do with negative studies because they might only be done over a one or two year period. And we're really, we need a lifetime to study true effect of some of these therapies. There's same conflicting evidence with use of high-dose calcium and so on. So I just want to remind you, once again, the reductionist theory. The vitamin and the benefits of vitamin also, in a food, reflect the company it keeps. So eating foods high in vitamin E are extremely good for you. Vitamin B12 enhances your cognitive health, reduces risk of, of cognitive disease. Vitamin B6 reduces the risk of depression. So there are many diets and diet patterns that are associated with change in disease where the specific vitamin itself has never been shown to be change in disease, and that's because getting it in the form of food, you're getting a very different combination of vitamins and nutrients that are working in the way our body is designed to work with nature. It's really good old-fashioned common sense. So I'm presenting to you not that vitamins and supplements are all bad, but we do need to put emphasis on food first. We cannot approximate the power of nature. And these are just some studies that have looked at either some problems with vitamins or diets high in these vitamins, how they've helped. B6, I mentioned depression, B12, cognitive health, and so on. 
So what about diet and Parkinson's disease? Well, there's evidence that a diet and low saturated fats might reduce the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. The Mediterranean diet reducing the risk of Parkinson's disease. There's also some um, modest evidence looking at increased risk. For instance, men drinking milk or dairy. And the truth is the Mediterranean diet does so much. It's not just Parkinson's disease. And one particular study showed a significant reduction risk of Parkinson's disease when adhering to a Mediterranean diet. And I don't have time to talk a lot about what the Mediterranean diet is today, but probably the best definition of the Mediterranean diet is what it's not. It's not the American diet, right? It's not that white tan, you know, white bread, potato chips, donuts, so on and so forth. It is a diet that is high in antioxidants, high in anti-inflammatory effects, high in fruits and vegetables, low in saturated fats from animal meats, high in vegetable protein, nuts, seeds, beans, fish, olive oil, even red wine. Now, a little bit about safety when we're talking about vitamins and supplements just to wrap up the, these biological theory, uh, therapies. So one is that all that is natural doesn't mean it's not toxic. For instance, vitamin D is an example. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. Lower in Parkinson's disease, many people are on supplementation, but it's helpful to get a level to know where you are with your supplementation. What is your level of vitamin D? Because it actually can be toxic. And toxic levels of vitamin D are also so associated with additional problems. So vitamin D is, is intricately associated with calcium metabolism and strength of bones. That's a good thing. But too much toxicity could actually cause calcification outside of our skeletal system. What would that be? Atherosclerosis. So just because something is natural doesn't mean it's all good. Just because something is pharmaceutical doesn't mean it's all bad. Well, it's, again, that balance in thought is really very important. What I'm telling you here is probably you're going to leave and say, Dr. Drew didn't tell me anything. It was all good old-fashioned common sense. But I think sometimes we have to be re-reminded of good old-fashioned common sense, which, by the way, I think is not always that common. So it's, it's, it's helpful to hear this. Now, the FDA does not regulate vitamins and supplements. So it's important to know if you're taking something that you're taking what you think you are taking. And there are websites that can help out with this. One way is to look at something as USP verified. USP stands for United States Pharmacopeia. That's an independent organization that measures whether something is pure, whether it's as potent as it's supposed to be, and how the body handles it. So it's a way to be sure that you're getting what you think you are getting. So in summary, from a biological theory point of view, you have to start with the diet. Diet first, vitamin and supplements second. If you choose vitamin and supplements, not all without side effects, review it with your healthcare, uh, healthcare provider. Let's talk about body therapies. And there's lots of reasons to talk about body therapies, the value of physical therapy and exercise and neuroplasticity, neuroreeducation, just the benefits of maybe some manipulative therapies. Believe it or not, even just a decade ago, physical therapy was considered an alternative therapy. It all has to do with our, our ideas of what's alternative or what is not. Now there's many reasons to exercise. And we all know this now, whether it's to enhance our fitness, improve our movement symptoms so we can perform better motorically, our general health. Well, Parkinson's is only going to feel as good as our general health. Neural re-education, retraining the brain to combat some of the physiologic changes of Parkinson's on movement, right? Or maybe it's prevention, prevention of postural changes, balance issues, falls. Also, to enhance our resiliency. I always tell my patients, I want your balance to be way up here. Because if you do have a change in your balance over time with your Parkinson's, and it comes to here, that's better than starting here and going to there. 
So enhancing your resiliency and your strength, but also other things. Exercise helps mood, thinking function, self-esteem, weight, so on and so forth. And even re-changes the brain or this whole concept of neuroplasticity, altering brain function as a response to our activities and exercise and so on. And there's lots of studies looking at exercise and Parkinson's disease. And once again, I'm going to talk about this reductionist theory because people think, I have to do this. It's got to be this way. And there are many reasons to look at exercise and what fits you. So there's forced and intensive exercise, whether it be tandem or, or uh, uh, tandem cycling or treadmill, tango, yoga, resistance training, lifting weights, walking, Tai Chi, all of these exercises have shown to help people with Parkinson's disease in different ways. And so once again, a balanced approach to exercise may, might be very important. Now, our experiences and exercise the same actually changes how our brain changes. And there's some interesting pictures up here, and I'll just walk you through a few. The one in the upper left-hand corner Older people, not with Parkinson's, but I bring this one up for a particular reason. They separated the group into high intensity versus low intensity. And then they looked at their brain scans. And you'll see blue and yellow on the slices of the brain there. One is an increase in brain size or volume with high intensity. One is low intensity. So it shows a few things. One is you can increase your brain size due to sprouting and enhanced connections of nerve cells with exercise. And two is even low intensity makes a difference. Because I sometimes hear from people, oh, I can't do that high intensity cycling or I can't do that, all that running on a treadmill. Even low intensity work makes a difference. There's also a picture here on the lower left-hand corner looking at high-intensity cycling. And what they showed as they measured brain glucose activity, they showed that the cycling approximated the same pattern of activity that the medicines did. And we know that exercise in animal models and animal studies even protects little animals from developing Parkinson's disease from a nerve toxin. So the power of exercise is quite strong. But once again, I just remind you about the reductionist theory because, you know, three years ago, it was all about tango. Then it became all about tandem cycling. Then it became all about Tai Chi. Every year we seem to have a favorite based on the research of the year. But when you think about just tango, think about what it might mean to you to do tango. Well, it's physical, it's aerobic, it adds music, it's creative, it's social. You might even say, you know, it's sexy, it's relational, you can do it with your partner, right? It's, it's, it's fun, it's new, it's different. It uses maybe even the power of touch. So we have to remember, once again, this concept of wholeness and healing when we look at, when we look at exercises that really expand our experience and our brain's experience, I believe we may be getting more sense of healing, neuroplasticity, and well-being. So for you, it might be tango, but for somebody else, it might be something entirely different. And there are body therapies out there that have been looked at for Parkinson's disease, a little bit of research behind it, like Feldenkrais or um, other therapies, Alexander Technique, Traeger Technique. And these are practitioners who are certified in movement who are looking at patterns or habits of movement and trying to change, change these habits over time to enhance normal pre-Parkinson's movement. And there's a small body of evidence to show in research that they have been helpful. But for some people, they can be extremely helpful. Massage therapy. Certainly, many people after massage feel their rigidity, their tightness, their just sense of well-being, reduced stress is better. We know that. And hard to study, but some emerging research is looking at massage. May actually improve in some people over the short-term movement capabilities. There's little research looking at chiropractic therapy, but most of the research in chiropractic therapy is around the mechanism of pain and shows in back pain, 
or other pain syndromes, that chiropractic manipulation reduces the need for pain medicine in controlled studies. And pain is a part of Parkinson's. It may or may not be a therapy that is effective for you. And when we talk about body therapies and experience and neuroplasticity, we learn a few things. Even a little bit matters. And I think this is important because you don't have to do 40 minutes of exercise to make a difference. Maybe we want you to do 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes of exercise, but what if you can only start with three minutes? Should you do nothing or just do three minutes? Start with something and move it forward because we can measure brain changes even with five minutes of activity, enhance brain activities in the motor cortex of the brain. Do something, but it also sets, remember the pattern and the habit, like Feldenkrais therapy, it sets a pattern of activity going. Practice is important. We know this, of course, to do better, to move better. Practicing that movement is going to be very important. But I want to return your attention to complexity, enrichment, and stress. And there's a lot of research now looking, and they use animal models to do this. There's a lot of research looking at purely just going through the motions and doing an exercise is one thing. But incorporating an exercise that is complex or enriched or meaningful enhances the effect at the brain level in these animal studies. Remember the tango, right? Something about the meaning and all of the other experiences brought together. There's even a study looking at stress in animals, and they were looking at exercise and stress. And what they showed was that exercise protected the development of Parkinson's disease to, or Parkinsonism in this animal to a nerve toxin. But if the animal was stressed and exercised at the same time, and they stressed the animal by separating them from their litter mates, by changing their sleep-wake cycle, by changing their diet, sounds pretty similar, doesn't it? It's a lot about how we experience stress. When they stressed the animal, the exercise no longer worked as protection. So if we only focus on vitamins and supplements, if we only focus on exercise, we might not get the full effect because stress is a part of our lives. Now I have the definition of mind-body therapies here and you can read them at your leisure. But stress is very powerful. You know that if you have tremor, you know that if you freeze or have dyskinesia, right? Stress is very powerful. You get stressed, the nervous system goes through some changes, your body responds, your tremor gets worse, it increases your stress. Pretty soon you're on that snowball effect. I've never had somebody say to me, you know, when I go on vacation and I'm sitting poolside and I'm all relaxed, guess what, doctor, my tremor's worse, right? That's not what they say. But when they're stressed and things are happening and life is throwing them curveballs, the tremor gets worse. Well, you could think of that as stress worsens tremor, but you can also think of it as an example about your mind influencing your symptoms. And it's not that stress itself is all bad, but it's how we manage stress and respond to stress. And stress does a lot of things to our body. And the ones that I highlighted on this list, again, you could read it at your leisure, the ones I highlighted, these are areas of your body function that are not only under involuntary control and affected by stress, but you have control. And the reason why I highlight this is because really all of, pretty much all of the mindful and healing therapies act on these activities. They use the power of the breath or they use the power of the thoughts or the power of the body. And so it's not that one mind-body therapy is better than the other. They're all using these same root causes. It's what's best for you, I believe, which is important. And it turns out even our thoughts affect neuroplasticity, right? We're wired to be negative. And this really surprised me when I first heard it. Well, it shouldn't have surprised me. We, we like the negative. We, for some reason, we go to the negative. But why? Because it makes sense from a developmental point of view, from a safety point of view. Our brains are wired to react to problems much faster than positive. 
because it's much more important that you don't run quickly to this in the corner there versus run away from this. So we're actually wired in this way. But it turns out we have control over this, what we call negative bias. And research look at this negative bias and how our nerves are wired. We have positive offset. And for the sake of time, I'm going to leave you with this last slide, positive offset. And what that means is this. If, and whether it's measured in the laboratory, behaviorally by measuring people, even mathematical models, physicists doing mathematical models, have found approximately three to one ratio, three positive offset to one negative bias. So what that means is if you have three positive experiences to every one negative, it increases your resiliency, your ability to fight disease, your ability to fight and, and enhance how you feel in the setting of disease and so on. But the important thing about this positive offset, it doesn't have to be a hit you over the head. It doesn't have to be winning the lottery, getting a raise, your children get into Harvard. It doesn't have to be that. It could be, I'm just happy to be here today. The sun was shining today. This is a great cup of coffee. You know, I appreciate the smile of my family. Or It can be the little things. But the problem with the little things is they're little. They're big, but they're little. So the thing is, you have to see them. You have to be aware. And that's where a lot of mindful based therapies and mind body medicine which is one of my areas of interest help us experience that and see it so we don't just run through life and not appreciate the positive offset because if you have Parkinson's disease you do have the negative biases there you have the moments and how you feel day in and day out but make sure you open your eyes to and be aware of and appreciate the positive offset. So for today, I want you to think of what your three positives are that you got from today. Hopefully the first one is just being here amongst the group. So once again, for the sake of time, I think I'm going to stop here. You do have some more information that you can read. And I am going to take some questions. And I just invite you, I do do a blog because I get a lot of questions, and this is a brand new one that I started because I was interested in expanding my blog to more than just Parkinson's, but tremor, dystonia, and other movement disorders. So feel free to ask any questions on the blog, and every week I answer a particular question. Although they are about the disease, it's really also about living your best and managing from a holistic point of view. So thank you for your time and attention. Looks like we got one question here. Okay. Okay, so I think there are two questions here. And what is, what is a recommendation for restless jaw? And I think what the person is referring to is tremor in the face, tremor in the, in the lower face. Tremor can be difficult to treat. So... Certainly, our medications for Parkinson's disease help tremor, but there are times when tremor is just stubborn and doesn't respond well to medicine. I mean, even deep brain stimulation is an appropriate treatment for tremor in the right patient, not, not necessarily all patients. So the most important thing is to talk to your doctor about the medications and the medications that may help tremor. And I find carbidopa, levodopa is still one of the best medicines for movement, including tremor. Many people feel dopaminergic agonists like Meripex can help tremor. So it's a, it's, a complex, it's a complex decision. But the problem with tremor is it also responds to everything else. And going back to what I talked about today, stress is a driver of tremor. I think tremor is the, probably the best barometer of stress that we have a little bit of stress. Right, you might go to your doctor's office and he or she wants to know how you're doing with tremor. What, is the, what do they have you do? Maybe a task. Count back from seven by 100, right? And then what happens? Tremor gets worse. So thinking about some of these therapies that enhance the relaxation, massage therapy, music therapy, meditation, guided imagery. And the other thing about treating tremor is twofold. One is treating the tremor 
to try to reduce it with these relaxation therapies. The other is managing your mind and your thoughts when you have tremor. I just did an article on mindfulness and tremor for the International Central Tremor Foundation. It was really about where your mind goes when you have tremor and how that might escalate the tremor. Because when you have tremor, the knee-jerk reaction, you're not even thinking, but your mind is already in the place that's is bad, this is horrible, I need to get rid of this tremor. And then that snowballs, that downward negative bias. So that mindfulness about understanding, seeing the tremor, accepting the tremor, letting it go, I didn't say you have to like it, and letting it go and knowing that the next moment the tremor will get better or will change. So really the work with the mind. You have, did you have another one? Where does a personal belief in God fit in the picture? Well, I didn't talk about the higher power, and, the, and there is a little bit later, I think, about spirituality, but it fits. It fits because of this sense of healing and wholeness and meaning and value and purpose. And when I talk about spirituality, usually I don't necessarily talk about organized religion or a particular uh, God or what have you, but I talk about what brings meaning, purpose, and value to life. And certainly, you know, um, your religious beliefs are an important part of that. But for people that may not be um, part of an organized or structured religion or philosophy, they still have that spiritual meaning and connectedness and what brings that, what connects us to one another and brings meaning and so on. So I think it's a really strong driver of so much of this. And many people who have spiritual beliefs and spiritual health, we find, do better, especially as the symptoms of disease or Parkinson's progress because they have their sense of what is still making them whole and giving them meaning. So it fits very well. And I think, is that it? 